we at the Fed understand the hardship that high inflation is causing. A blow to the wallets of Americans, the biggest interest rate hike in 30 years. The Federal Reserve increasing rates up three quarters of a percent. So what does that mean for your mortgage, car loan, credit cards, and the price of everyday items? Becca Jarvis is standing by to explain how this impacts your money. Major news for millions of families across the country. An FDA panel has endorsed Pfizer and Moderna COVID vaccines for children as young as six months old. The only group of Americans still unable to get those shots. But will parents get their young kids vaccinated right away? How effective have those vaccines proven to be in studies? And just how soon could those shots be administered? Historic and devastating flooding at Yellowstone forces 10,000 people to evacuate. Days of heavy rain and rapid snowmelt swamp the National Park, crippling parts of it, likely closed for the season. Our wheel car is there as ABC senior meteorologist Rob Marciano tracks what's next. Americans reportedly captured by Russian forces. The two said to be military veterans reportedly volunteering to fight for Ukraine taken near Kharkiv. What we know about the capture as the president announces the single biggest U.S. military aid commitment to date. Costly and controversial, Operation Lone Star, a Texas-run border security initiative, is leading to the arrest of thousands of migrants seeking asylum. Tonight, ABC News Live looks closer at Governor Greg Abbott's strategy to expel migrants, who's fronting the cost of the operation, and who's ultimately paying the price. The current federal law authorizes somebody to do exactly what Gaston did, which was to come across the river and, and seek asylum. <laughs> with a message. A song written two decades ago has taken on new meaning in the face of the war in Ukraine. And the band behind it has re-recorded the hit in an effort to connect with the people of Russia, their hope to spread peace through a melody. Ideally, if we had any Russian friends and who knew had family over there, they might share it. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us tonight. We are tracking the big move taken by the FDA, which means that children under the age of five are now one step closer to getting vaccines and word of two Americans captured in Ukraine. But we do begin with the biggest interest rate hike by the Fed since 1994 and how it will affect your money. The Federal Reserve raised its key short term interest rate by three quarters of a percent. The higher rate will be passed along to Americans in more costly car loans higher interest rates on credit cards and higher mortgage rates that could make what you have to pay to buy a house skyrocket. Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell defended the move and said, unfortunately, the Fed can't control much of what's driving inflation, especially the war in Ukraine and its effects on oil prices. So what can the president and Congress do? And is any relief in sight? We are standing by to talk with House Majority Leader Steny Hoyer. But first, our chief economics and business correspondent, Rebecca Jarvis, leads us off. Tonight, with Americans facing historic inflation and record high gas prices, the Federal Reserve increasing interest rates by three quarters of a percent, the largest hike since 1994. We're strongly committed to bringing inflation back down and we're moving expeditiously to do so. The Fed's aggressive move meant to help stabilize prices will also make it more expensive to borrow money. Everything from new credit cards, where the average APR just topped 20% for the first time ever, to car loans, to mortgage rates, which are already climbing from 3% in January to more than 6% now. The cost of homeownership has gone up at the same time that rental rates are rising as well. In real terms, that means the monthly mortgage payment on a $450,000 home has jumped from roughly $1,500 in January to nearly $2,200 today. Alyssa Isaacs and Drew Anderson in Wichita know this firsthand as they try to buy a home. We weren't particularly happy with the rate we got, but the rates have gone up since then. As for those record oil and gas prices, President Biden sending a letter to executives of seven major oil companies warning them he's considering invoking emergency powers to boost refinery output. Warning, profit margins well above normal being passed directly onto American families are not acceptable. But U.S. refineries are already currently running near full capacity. The White House today pressed on what the letters actually mean offering few specifics. We are calling on them to do the right thing, to be patriots here, uh, and not to use the war uh, as an excuse or as a, as a reason uh, to, not put, to not put out a production. 
Rebecca Jarvis joins us now. And Rebecca, the Fed made this decision to bring down inflation while also trying to avoid a recession in the coming months. Are they going to be able to thread this needle? It's difficult, Lindsay. The odds of that recession continue to rise. This inflation, the degree and depths of it, really caught the Federal Reserve as well as this administration off guard. And a number of economists believe they should have begun to act sooner. Moody's Analytics out with a note tonight saying the Fed could be facing a very difficult decision ahead, whether to plunge this economy into a mild recession in order to tame inflation or waiting and causing an even more severe recession. Lindsay? All right, Rebecca Jarvis, our thanks to you. For more on the economy, guns, and January 6th, let's bring in the second most powerful person in the House, House Majority Leader, Steny Hoyer from Maryland. Thank you so much for your time tonight, Congressman. Thank you, Lindsay. Glad to be with you. So today, the Federal Reserve hiked interest rates by 0.75 percent, the biggest single increase since 1994. As we've been reporting, Americans are certainly feeling the pinch. What concrete steps can Congress take in order to help give Americans some semblance of relief? Well, we have taken uh, concrete steps, and we need to continue taking them. As a matter of fact, uh, we passed a number of pieces of legislation we think will bring costs down for Americans, uh, the cost of their health care, cost of prescription drugs, uh, cost of a number of other things. And, and tomorrow, we're going to vote on and pass a bill which will try to bring the food prices and fuel prices down by a number of different policies that we'll adopt uh, in, in legislation. Uh, we know that Americans are hurting. Uh, they're hurting when they go to the grocery store. They're hurting when they go to the uh, gas station. Uh, and those are things they can't put off. Uh, they, they need to eat. And they need to get to work or get to school or get their kids uh, to places. Uh, and the sticker shock at the pump is terrible. And as you know, President Biden is exploring all options to try to get prices down, including a controversial trip to Saudi Arabia when we're talking about gas in particular. Now, we've seen the 9-11 family speak out against that trip. And, and take a listen to video Jamal Khashoggi's fiance posted to Twitter today to President Biden. If you have to put oil over the principles and expediency over values, can you at least ask where is Jamal's body? Doesn't he deserve a proper burial? And what happened to his killers? Putting oil over principle. What would you tell Khashoggi's fiance if you had a conversation with her about why this presidential meeting is a good or a bad idea? I think this trip uh, is a trip that the president is going to go. I think, I hope he'll be very direct uh, with Khashoggi or other uh, Saudi officials regarding their human rights performance. Uh, it is not what it ought to be. We ought to make it clear that it's not what it ought to be, and, and, and we don't support that. On the other hand, they're a major supplier of petroleum. They're also a member of OPEC, which is the cartel which tries to control prices. Uh, and I think uh, the president needs to make it very clear in private, doesn't have to be a public berating, but in private that we need to bring these prices down. We need to increase supply, which will bring prices down. Yeah, you know, we talked to uh, a lawmaker from South Dakota last week, and she talked about how uh, the only six that her constituents are concerned about is the $6 gas prices a gallon, not January 6th. Uh, many Americans certainly appear to be more concerned about the rising prices, not necessarily the day-to-day -day of the January 6th hearings. What do you personally hope comes from these hearings? Let me first of all say that person uh, whom you talked to, uh, who you talked to, saying that January 6th was not of interest to the American people, uh, I disagree with that very severely. We saw treason on January 6th. We saw insurrection on January 6th. We saw uh, a uh, attempt to stop a constitutional duty of the Congress of the United States in electing a president of the United States. Uh, that was treason. That was insurrection. That was violence. Uh, law enforcement officers were killed. And to dismiss that, to rationalize it, uh, to diminish uh, the consequences of that uh, are dangerous for our country. I think the January 6th Commission is doing exactly what it needs to do, tell the truth. Liz Cheney is a Republican. Uh, she believes in telling the truth. She doesn't agree with me on most issues, uh, but she believes in following the facts. Uh, and very frankly, that's what the people of South Dakota, uh, the people of Maryland, my state, and the people of the, of the country need to do. 
The House's sweeping gun reform package appears doomed to fail in the Senate, but there is hope on that bipartisan framework in the Senate. I know Democrats have wanted significantly more, but this would be the first gun control legislation in three decades. In this case, is this a matter of uh, a little something is better than nothing at all? I think this was, is a step forward. Do I think it's enough? I don't, as you pointed out. But I think what the Senate is discussing now is a step forward that will make us uh, somewhat safer. Now, I voted for, in 1994, uh, the banning of the assault weapons, which I think are used to kill a lot of people quickly, not for hunting, not for target practice, but killing a lot of people quickly. That aside, what the Senate is discussing is a forward movement and will make our country a little safer. Uh, and I think it's worth doing if the Senate passes that bill. I would hope they would pass our bill as well. Uh, we dealt with uh, raising the age limit to 21 uh, to purchase these kinds of weapons. We uh, voted to eliminate bump stocks, which turn regular guns into machine guns. We, we, we voted to eliminate having ghost guns, which are made uh, at home uh, with kits, and there's no way to identify the gun. Uh, we, we voted uh, to make uh, sure our communities were safer by saying you have to, if you have a gun, store it safely. Don't let your kid or somebody else get a hold of it and use it uh, to fatal uh, effect on so many people. So uh, I think that bill is a good bill. But I think the Senate uh, is talking about progress, and that's what we want to get, at least progress. House Majority Leader Steny Hoyer, we thank you so much for your time. I appreciate your insight. Thank you very much. Now we head overseas to the war in Ukraine and word that two Americans fighting for the Ukrainian side may have been captured by Russian forces. This is conditions are deteriorating in a key eastern city as Russia advances. ABC's James Longman reports in for us once again near the front lines. Tonight, the families of two American veterans gone missing in Ukraine have asked U.S. lawmakers to help find them. It comes as reports surface that two Americans fighting for the Ukrainians have been captured by Russian forces near Kharkiv in the northeastern part of the country. The men, Alexander Druki, who's 39, and Andy Huynh, 27, were reportedly serving as volunteers with the Ukrainian army outfit. The U.S. State Department says they're aware of unconfirmed reports and are closely monitoring the situation. If it's true, we'll do everything we can to, to, uh, to get them uh, safely back home. The two men were said to be U.S. military veterans serving as volunteers with the Ukrainian army unit. Other Westerners have been taken prisoner during this war, including two from the U.K. who were sentenced to death by Russian-backed separatists after they accused them of being mercenaries. This comes as President Biden announced the biggest single U.S. military aid commitment to date after speaking with Ukrainian President Zelensky today. A billion dollars in new equipment, including howitzers, ammunition for rocket systems, and for the first time, American harpoon anti-ship missile systems. And David, the U.S. has confirmed that the first 60 Ukrainians have now completed their training on those American advanced missile systems. They're expected to be here in Ukraine in the next two weeks. David? I'll take that back here, James. Thank you. Now to the latest on the coronavirus. An FDA advisory panel met today to discuss two vaccines for America's youngest age group, the last group of Americans still not eligible for a COVID vaccine. This comes just one day after the same panel unanimously voted in favor of Moderna's vaccine for 6 to 17-year-olds. ABC's Whit Johnson has the details. Tonight, an FDA panel voting unanimously to give COVID vaccines the green light for children under five. The vote is unanimous. We have 21 out of 21 yes votes. The FDA says both vaccines from Pfizer and Moderna appeared safe and effective, despite mild symptoms like irritability and fever. Does the benefit outweigh the risk of this vaccine? And I think that the evidence is pretty clear. Pfizer's vaccine, a three-shot series, is one-tenth the size of the adult dose. The company's early data showed it was 80% effective in preventing symptomatic COVID. Moderna's vaccine, only two shots, is a quarter of the size of the adult dose. Early data showed it was about 40 to 50% effective at preventing mild infections. But experts caution those numbers are based on small samples. Both vaccines generated antibody levels against 
against Omicron similar to those seen in adults, meaning they will likely also offer protection against severe disease. We should be paying attention also to the antibody response and how well these vaccines protect against severe illness and hospitalization. With the sign-off from the full FDA and the CDC expected within days, we could see shots going into arms as early as next Tuesday. So many parents eager for this moment. Whit Johnson joins us now. Whit, what's the latest with Dr. Fauci and his health? Lindsay, we're learning Dr. Anthony Fauci has tested positive for COVID. We're told the 81-year-old is experiencing mild symptoms and is currently being treated with the antiviral drug Paxlovid. He's fully vaccinated and double boosted. He was seen over the weekend at an event being honored by his alma mater, Holy Cross. But still, Dr. Fauci is scheduled to testify virtually before a Senate committee tomorrow. Lindsay. With Johnson, our thanks to you. And we turn now to tomorrow's January 6th hearing in Washington, which is set to focus on the pressure applied to former Vice President Mike Pence to block the certification of the election. And tonight, ABC News has exclusive new images of Pence after he had been hurried from the Senate floor with his family as the rioters breached the Capitol. Here's ABC's chief Washington correspondent, Jonathan Carl. Tonight, ABC News has obtained photos of former Vice President Mike Pence and his family sheltering in the Capitol. This one taken just minutes after he was evacuated from the Senate floor on January 6th. You can see the fear in his daughter's face. His brother looking on as Second Lady Karen Pence draws the curtains closed, worried the rioters outside could see where they were. Some of the mob was chanting, hang Mike Pence, and had already breached the building. Minutes later, Pence and his family were rushed downstairs, taken to a loading dock beneath the Capitol complex, tweeting these photos that night after the mob was cleared. Finally, this picture, Pence after the riot, back in the Capitol with his daughter, working on the speech he would soon give when Congress reconvened to certify Joe Biden's election victory. To those who wreaked havoc in our Capitol today, you did not win. Violence never wins. Freedom wins. And this is still the people's house. Jonathan Carl joins us now from Washington. John, this pressure campaign that the former vice president faced will certainly be the focus of tomorrow's hearing. Who do we expect to hear from? Well, there's going to be live testimony and tape testimony, as we have seen in the two previous hearings. In terms of live testimony, we'll hear from Greg Jacob. He was the chief counsel in the vice president's office, Pence's top lawyer, as he was pushing back at this effort from Donald Trump to try to get him to overturn the election results. He was right there with Pence at his side throughout all of it. But in terms of the tape testimony, you'll hear from other top Pence aides, including his chief of staff, Mark Short. Remember, Lindsay, they were worried for Pence's life as that mob attacked the Capitol, and Donald Trump was at the White House watching it all unfold on television. And there's been some back and forth from the committee on whether some Republican members gave tours of the Capitol to January 6 participants the day before the riot. That's something that we have been hearing from that day. What's the latest on that front? Well, it's unclear the significance of this. Uh, what we see in this surveillance uh, footage uh, that the committee has obtained is, is a, a group of people given a tour of one of the House office buildings, not the Capitol itself. The complex is all connected, but it's not the big domed building. It's across the street. Uh, and the person uh, that they see taking what seems to be, you know, photographs of stairwells and security checkpoints, that person was part of the protest or the riot outside the Capitol, uh, but there's no evidence that that person actually ever went into the Capitol, and that person, in fact, uh, has not been charged with a crime. And one other point on this, Lindsay, is the Capitol Police has reviewed this footage, and they say uh, that they don't think there was anything suspicious. So uh, it looks odd, for sure. The committee's interested in it, uh, but it's unclear where it goes in terms of their investigation. All right. Jonathan Carl, our thanks to you, as always. Thank you. Meanwhile, primary results from across the country last night could have some far-reaching consequences for the midterms and beyond as candidates embracing former President Trump's false claims about the election gain ground. Let's dive into what it all means with ABC News' political director, Rick Klein, who joins us now from Washington. Rick, so we talked last night about those two key House races that we were monitoring in South Carolina, each showing the power that former President Trump still has over the Republican Party. Break down what we saw in those two races. Yeah, Lindsay, for the first time this election cycle, 
a Republican who supported impeaching Donald Trump lost his job in a Republican primary. That happened here in the 7th Congressional District. Congressman Tom Rice was defiant. He said if he could have it to do all over again, he would impeach Donald Trump again. The voters felt otherwise. He lost by a two-to-one margin, got absolutely blown out by a Republican opponent who was endorsed by former President Trump. A different strategy on display here in the Charleston area. You had Congresswoman Nancy Mace, who also was a Trump critic in and around January 6th. She never voted for impeachment, but she was very critical of the former president's actions. But since then, she was kind of quiet about it, and she embraced the MAGA movement as much as she could. She hung on and survived. So Trump was actually one for two in these big races, what's being called the revenge tour, uh, took him to South Carolina. And it was actually a big one for him to take down one of these Republicans who, who called out his big lie and, and actually supported the impeachment. And a special election in South Texas underscored another potential vulnerability for Democrats this midterm cycle. What happened in that House race and why is it so significant? A really unique set of circumstances. This is a, a vacant seat that, that stretches down from Brownsville up until the Texas Hill Country just south of San Antonio, east of, of uh, and, and just, just out of, outside of Austin as well. And there, Republicans decided to make a, a big play for this district, even though it's been a Democratic district forever. It is actually getting more Democratic in redistricting at the end of the year. But there you saw that the Republican candidate, Myra Flores, for the first time in decades, a Republican able to win down there in South Texas. That's being seen as a major sign that Republicans could win Latino voters in particular in Texas, these other districts that lean blue or similar dynamics where you could see a Republican break through. And I think it also just speaks to the Republican versus the Democratic brand in a time of, of economic struggles, even issues like immigration, uh, not able to help the Democrats, at least for this time. The district, of course, is changing, so she may not be in Congress that long, but it's uh, still a pretty, pretty big win. And out west in Nevada, the stage is now set for a critical Senate race in November that could ultimately help decide who controls the Senate next year. Break down the players there. Yeah, this is the House map in Nevada, so it gives you a sense of what a battleground we're talking about. At least two, maybe three of the districts could be in play. And the Republicans on the Senate side think they have one of their best opportunities for a pickup. Adam Laxalt, who's the son and grandson of, uh, of former uh, congressional lawmakers, was the pick of Donald Trump, also the pick of just about all of the Republican establishment. He had a pretty spirited primary, but he was able to, uh, to, to prevail uh, by tying himself to Trump and maybe uniting those wings of the Republican Party. Senator Catherine Cortez Masto, uh, first Term. She replaced Harry Reid just about five and a half, six years ago. Uh, she's going to be one of the most endangered Democrats in one of the close, most closely watched races in the country. And we also had our eye on the Nevada Secretary of State race, where a Trump-backed election denier won the Republican nomination. That, of course, could have some major implications going into 2024. Explain the fallout that we're now seeing from the big lie in these midterms. Yeah, Lindsay, this is a map of the states that, uh, that we've compiled, along with our partners at 538, that have at least one, in many cases, well, more than one candidates who embrace the big lie, deny the legitimacy of the election. And if you flip to just find the battleground states, you see in a bunch of these states, we already saw in Pennsylvania, the gubernatorial candidate prevailing. Big deal to have in Nevada now a candidate for Senate, as well as the candidate for Secretary of State, both of whom say that the election was stolen. The Secretary of State's candidate, as a matter of fact, Lindsay, he has said he wouldn't have certified the election and he thinks his own election for a House race in 2020 was also stolen. So he is all in on the big lie, all in on Trumpism, all happening against the backdrop of January 6th and those hearings. So helpful to have you with us, Rick Klein. We appreciate it. Thanks, Lindsay. Federal hate crime charges have now been filed against the 18-year-old accused in the racist killings at a Buffalo supermarket. Attorney General Merrick Garland unveiled 26 new charges today at the scene of the crime. And tonight, there's new evidence of the suspect's plans to kill as many black people as possible. Here's ABC's Chief Justice Correspondent, Pierre Thomas. Attorney General Merrick Garland laying flowers at that makeshift memorial at the scene of the Buffalo grocery store massacre today officially declaring it an unmitigated, intentional act of hate-based murder. No one in this country should have to bury a loved one because of such hate. Prosecutors flatly saying today 18-year-old Peyton Gendron's goal was to kill as many blacks as possible, charging him with 26 counts of hate crimes and weapons violations. An unsealed affidavit describes Gendron's calculated planning of his seeking the highest chance of success when he went on a shooting spree at the local supermarket. The new charges lay out how he selected the top supermarkets because of its high percentage of black people, that he scouted the location several times, making a map of its interior. One chilling scene from the massacre says it all. At one point, he aimed his rifle at a white male tops employee who had been shot in the leg and injured. 
Instead of shooting the white employee, the gunman apologized to him before continuing his attack. Clear he was only intending to target black people inside that supermarket that day. Pierre Thomas joins us now. Pierre, if convicted of these charges, what kind of punishment could the shooter face? Lindsay, while the Justice Department moratorium on federal executions is still in place, today the AG pointedly did not answer the question when he was pressed on whether he would seek the death penalty in this case. So that apparently is still on the table. Pierre Thomas, our thanks to you. Now to that historic flood emergency in the northern Rockies after days of heavy rain and a rapid snowmelt swamped Yellowstone National Park and neighboring towns. 10,000 campers were forced to evacuate tonight. There is still about a foot of snow on the mountains and there's more rain and more heat in the forecast, so more flooding is possible. Will Carr reports. Tonight with water levels dropping, we're seeing the trail of destruction after historic flooding wreaked havoc on Yellowstone National Park and the surrounding area. The floodwaters ate away at the banks of the Yellowstone River. There was a house at the end of this road. Today you can see the road has been washed away and the house is gone. New images capturing that harrowing moment. The house teetering on the edge, then crashing into the river washing five miles downstream. That's the whole house. And hitting this bridge. Oh. Yellowstone River swelling to nearly 14 feet, the highest ever recorded after days of heavy rain and unseasonably warm temperatures that rapidly melted snowpack. The landscape literally and figuratively has changed dramatically in the last 36 hours. Tonight, the town of Gardner ordered not to drink the water after a sewer pipe was compromised and a water main broke. This water plant in Billings, Montana, shut down due to flooding. It comes as Yellowstone's immediate future is in jeopardy. 10,000 visitors forced to evacuate, cars narrowly escaping rising waters on the last road out. The northern part of Yellowstone Park closed indefinitely. Businesses in Gardner, the northern gateway to the park, now wondering how they'll survive. It's going to be a crazy summer. Well, not crazy summer, unfortunately. Um, I think the financial impact is going to be enormous. We can imagine the impact will be just devastating for that area. Will Carr joins us now from near Yellowstone. And Will, you went out around with uh, your crew today looking at the destruction. What struck you most? Lindsay, I have to say the enormity of this disaster. We have gone more than 50 miles and we have seen bridges washed out. We've seen damage all across the area today. You can tell that the rain has stopped here, but it's supposed to get warm here in the coming days. There's still more than a foot of snow on the surrounding mountains. And as it gets hotter, there's a real concern here that there could be more flooding over the next week. Lindsay. All right, Will Carr, our thanks to you. And tonight, nearly 100 million Americans remain under alert for life-threatening heat from Texas to the Great Lakes to the southeast. Senior meteorologist Rob Marciano is tracking it all for us. Some heat as well as possible tornadoes. He joins us now from Wisconsin, which could be right in the danger zone. Hey, Rob. Hey, Lindsay, we certainly are, and the, the heat is certainly exacerbating the problem here. Just down the road in Milwaukee, they've had their highest heat index since 1948. We'll get to that in a second, but look behind me. These dark clouds are now moving over the state capitol. Those are tornado-worn storms that are moving from west to east. Here they are on the radar scope. The state, the eastern part of it, at least, still in that tornado watch for the next several hours. It's going to be dicey. The red polygons there, those are tornado warnings, and we've already had at least one drop with reports of damage, which we'll check out later. But that's not the only spot that we'll see storms that could do some damage tonight. The Florida Panhandle through Georgia, where it's very hot, and up the Appalachians in through central Pennsylvania. Damaging storms possible this evening, and tomorrow everything will kind of congregate over western New York and western Pennsylvania. But here's the heat. My goodness, look at Atlanta. Uh, parts of Georgia still under a warning through the Ohio River Valley, up through Chicago, where they've seen their warmest temperatures in a decade. And tomorrow, no better. Things kind of get squeezed a little bit a little farther south, but St. Louis, Tulsa, Little Rock, 106 in Nashville. It's going to feel like 104 in the shade in Charleston. These are heating disease that, especially at night, will be at dangerous levels for folks who don't have AC. Lindsay? Some ominous looking skies there behind you. Rob, our thanks to you. You bet. When we come back, more than a dozen children rush to the hospital emergency crews receiving multiple calls after a smell at the pool. We have the details. Our conversation with the lead singer in the group Dispatch and why he decided to sing their most famous song 
in Russian. And up next, a human rights lawyer fleeing a corrupt Venezuelan regime who was swept up in Operation Lone Star and our in-depth look at the number of resources Texas is pouring into it. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast, now streaming on ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families Trump. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. The hottest news in daytime are happening right here. We talk about things on this show that people don't talk about. That I can't wait to see. Honest takes from strong women. We need all hands on deck and we need it right now. This is the time to speak out unafraid to get real. We stick by our points of view. We're all seeing it differently and that's the beauty of The View. And that's why the most watched number one daytime talk show is The View. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Is that the gun? That's not the gun. What is it? I won't ask you again then. Are you a Nazi? <laughs> the deeper you go into the black market, you put people to your life like this. The darker it gets. Why hasn't anyone come out and spoken? It's about the money, that's how we do it. Trafficked. New episodes Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Police in upstate New York have charged this 60-year-old white male with a hate crime after he was caught on camera shouting racial slurs and waving a box cutter. But listen to this. He was doing that to a black father and son. The dad was a police lieutenant and pastor in the neighboring town. This all happened when the black family says that they slowed down to allow him to pass. For some Americans, they're considered law-breaking criminals, but for others, they're desperate humans fleeing corruption, violence, and catastrophes caused by climate change. The ongoing debate over migrants arriving to our nation's southern border is certainly a tenuous one, but a program launched by Governor Abbott, known as Operation Lone Star, is using state resources to allegedly bring safety and control back to Texas. Our ABC's Maria Villarreal brings us the first of a two-part report on the impact this policy is having, starting with the migrants seeking asylum. Grocery shopping. Patatas, la famosa patata. Museum hopping. La Virgen Morena. And a nature walk. It's the little things Gaston appreciates these days, but nothing comes close to video chats with his wife and children back home. Chao, Dios la bendiga. Chao, chao. Gaston says he's living in the U.S. alone, risking death threats while working as a human rights lawyer in Venezuela, a country plagued with political corruption, high unemployment, and severe economic issues. Que mi miedo es creíble. Mi miedo era ese. Mi miedo era este, que no estuviera preso, eh, que no pudiera socorrer a mi familia, este, que no los viera, 
y, y que me pasara algo, como le ha pasado a muchísimas personas. Gastón explains he spent years defending political opponents of Venezuela's Nicolás Maduro's regime, mostly students jailed for speaking out against the government. En Venezuela era un abogado en ejercicio, eh, dedicado eh, a la defensa, la defensa de los estudiantes. Defendíamos de manera gratuita sus intereses judiciales, al punto de llevarlos a libertad mm, por la malas prácticas que hacía el régimen contra esta persona solamente por su disidencia. Gastón worried it was only a matter of time before he ended up in a cell himself. He fled Venezuela, making his way to the U.S.-Mexico border to seek asylum in the United States. He swam across the Rio Grande hoping to surrender to U.S. border officials, but instead he was arrested by troopers with the Texas Department of Public Safety. Yo le presenté mis credenciales, mira, yo soy abogado, aquí está mi credencial y este, lo único que me dijo fue, este, te, te tengo que detener, coloca las manos atrás. Gastón says what followed was 33 days of hell. Te puedo decir que este es la discriminación más terrible que puede sufrir un ser humano privado de su libertad. In a statement to ABC News, the Texas Department of Criminal Justice says they've worked with the Texas Commission on Law Enforcement and the Texas Commission on Jail Standards to ensure identified state facilities meet state standards to hold pretrial confinees and post-conviction inmates. Gaston spent five weeks, and that's actually on the low end. We've had clients that have spent months in those prisons awaiting trials, months in those prisons, unable to afford bond. And these are people that are not criminals. Kristen Eaton represented Gaston's case against the state once he was detained. The current federal law authorizes somebody to do exactly what Gaston did, which was to come across the river and, and seek asylum. And so we have clients all over the country, again, that are here and able to apply for asylum and wait in the United States. Gaston is just one of thousands of migrants who have been kept in detention centers like this one, using Operation Lone Star, a Texas-run border security initiative created by Governor Greg Abbott. Texas will be taking its own unprecedented actions this month to do what no state in the America has ever done in the history of this country to better secure our state as well as our nation. In May of last year, Abbott filed a disaster declaration based on the influx of migrant traffic in Texas that covers 48 Texas counties, 32 of them along the border. The declaration leading to the creation of Operation Lone Star. I got you a program where an estimated 10,000 soldiers from the Texas National Guard and Department of Public Safety are being used for immigration patrols in addition to federal agents. Texas has essentially militarized the border to make apprehensions and arrests primarily of migrants for criminal trespass offenses. Governor Abbott says the program is intended to stop smugglers. Since the federal government, not states, has the power to enforce immigration law, Texas troopers can only make arrests if migrants trespass on a private property. Allí no había ningún, ningún, ningún aviso que dijera que, que eso era propiedad privada, ni que, ni que yo haya tumbado una pared, ni, ni haya penetrado una cerca. According to the Texas Department of Criminal Justice, to date the program has made just over 4,100 total trespassing arrests. We have clients that are arrested multiple times for criminal trespass. They're released and they come back. There's really no deterrent value in these criminal trespass prosecutions at all. The strategy of expelling migrants does not appear to have slowed immigration, but the price tag of funding the operation continues to go up, with Texas taxpayers fronting the cost. Texas has spent more than $4 billion on Operation Lone Star. That is a lot of money that is being spent, that has been taken away from other areas of need in Texas. In late April, nearly $500 million in additional funding was approved by Governor Abbott and state leadership for the operation. While Gaston's asylum case moves through the federal courts, he's hoping that he can one day make a living for himself in the U.S. and support his family back home.
por milagro de Dios, este, eh, ha querido que, que, que mi vida continúe, eh, que ayude a los míos, que ayude a mi familia, que ayude a mi país y que de una u otra manera pues, este, permanezcamos aquí en Estados Unidos a pesar de, de todas esas esa diferencias y todos esos acontecimientos que han pasado. Gracias a Dios eh, no me ha ido mal. Our thanks to Maria for that. Still ahead here on Prime, an update in the case of that Michigan officer charged with the murder in the death of Patrick Loyola. The Chinese state media report about their telescope detecting signs of alien life, but it was quickly taken down. So many are now asking why. And it's been 10 years of DACA. We take a look at the promises both fulfilled and denied by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day from chef and humanitarian Jose Andres. He reminds us of the indiscriminate attacks from Russia and its non-military impacts. The deeper you go into the black market, the darker it gets. Traffic, Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos, the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families Trump. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. A man vanishes without a trace. This can't be happening. Stealing $350 million. Bye-bye. We got a problem here. It's like, try to catch me if you can. Sorry about the language, but it's a holy story. He may be the least likely, most wanted fugitive, well, ever. Now, follow the clues on his trail. Where the is John Lufo? Have you seen this man? These days, with so much going on, it's hard to keep up. While others are recapping yesterday's headlines, we're bringing you the right now. This is the busy border crossing. Steel barricades, another strike. The right now look at the day ahead, how it affects you and your family. Record high gas prices. The threat of cyber warfare. Is peace possible? World News Now beginning at 2 a.m. Eastern, followed by America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. Streaming here on ABC News Live. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7, there for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated ABCNews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at ABCNews.com. And here's to everything ahead. Welcome back, everyone. It's been a decade since the launch of the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program, better known as DACA. Let's take a look by the numbers. In June of 2012, former President Barack Obama introduced the DACA program, which provided work permits and protection from deportation from those who entered the U.S. as children prior to 2012. Applicants had to be 15 years old to apply and also be enrolled in or have graduated from school without a criminal record. Since it was announced, more than 835,000 undocumented young people have received protection and work authorization through DACA, according to U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services. Some 60% of those protected by DACA are now 26 or older. Some 80% of DACA recipients are currently employed, according to a 2021 survey from the left-leaning Center for American Progress. And according to the Department of Homeland Security, DACA recipients and their households pay $5.6 billion in federal taxes annually. The program has faced constant challenges. In 2017, the program 
was rescinded by the Trump administration, but after legal challenges, a five to four Supreme Court ruled in favor of Dreamers in June of 2020. In 2021, the Biden administration made efforts to strengthen DACA, but in July of last year, a federal judge in Texas ruled that DACA was illegal and blocked new applicant approvals while maintaining protections for those currently in the program. The Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals will hear the case this July, and it will likely go back to the Supreme Court. But without a long-term immigration fix by Congress, the program still faces a rather uncertain future. And we still have lots to get to here on Prime tonight. The verdict tonight for the January 6th defendant seen carrying that Confederate flag into the U.S. Capitol. And the alarming new data about how many crashes could be caused by driver-assisted technology, particularly in Tesla's autopilot feature. But first, a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust, and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I know what happened and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart they did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find. Unless you try to find it. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. The Federal Reserve announcing the largest interest rate hike in nearly three decades, raising rates by 0.75%, trying to cool off an overheating economy and bring down record high inflation. We at the Fed understand the hardship that high inflation is causing. The rate increase sparking fears the economy could enter into decline, causing a recession, or worse, so-called stagflation when rate hikes don't bring down prices but do slow the economy to a point where wages stay stagnant and unemployment rises. The more the Fed raises interest rates, the more Americans have to pay to borrow money, affecting everything from credit cards to mortgages. President Biden now sending this letter to the major oil companies, blasting them for raking in record profits while so many Americans are hurting and calling on them to increase their production of gas and diesel to help lower prices. The city of Grand Rapids has fired Christopher Schur, the officer charged with murder in the death of Patrick Leoya. Schur's pleaded not guilty to the fatal shooting of Leoya, a black motorist who tried to flee during a traffic stop. Schur's attorneys say he acted in self-defense. Prosecutors say Schur 
shot Leoya in the back of the head in what they called an unjustified shooting. A father and son who were among the first of the rioters to enter the U.S. Capitol on January 6, 2021, learned their fate after a bench trial on federal charges. They tried to block Congress's certification of Joe Biden's presidential victory. Kevin and Hunter Seifert were both found guilty on five counts, including obstruction of an official proceeding and aiding and abetting. New preliminary government data shows how many vehicles that can drive using self-driving technology are getting involved in crashes. Tesla's autopilot feature is loved by many owners, but it's been gaining growing attention from federal safety regulators after crashes. New data out from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration finds over the course of 10 months, there were close to 400 car crashes in the U.S. that involved driver assist technologies. 273, or about 70% of them, involved Teslas. In the crash six people died and five were seriously injured. In Virginia, emergency officials have responded to a hazmat incident at a local pool in Chesterfield. A local TV station reported 15 children were taken to the hospital and one adult was injured. Right now we have no idea what it could be. This is pretty common in the summer times with pool chemicals. This time of the year, a lot of times uh, people are mixing chemicals with their home pools because this happens a lot at homes as well. And China now says it may have picked up signals from ET. Researchers at a massive radio telescope in China, the most sensitive in the world, say it may have captured a signal from an alien civilization. But they also say they haven't been able to identify them yet. The report was apparently removed from the website of the Science and Technology Daily, the official newspaper of China's Science and Technology Ministry. But by then, the news had already started trending on social networks and was picked up by other media outlets, including state-run ones. Very interesting story there. Welcome back, everyone. Music is powerful and can be used as a tool to help change the world that we live in. Now a song that was written about, um, more than 20 years ago is taking on a new message as a war rages to our east. The American roots band Dispatch has re-recorded their hit The General as a way to reach out to the people of Russia. ABC's Phil Lipoff sat down with the band's lead singer about the message behind the melody. <laughs> With this Instagram post, Chad Stokes, frontman of the American band Dispatch, is hoping a song he wrote more than two decades ago will reach the Russian people and help end a war. In 1997, Chad wrote the story of a military leader who has a dream the night before battle. In his dream, he's with the enemy. He sees them as, as people. I order you all to not follow me into battle. I will go myself, but but you need to go live your lives. That song, The General, remains the band's best known hit with lyrics and a storyline that have proved timeless. Particularly poignant today, as war rages in Ukraine, tens of thousands dead, millions more refugees. Dispatch, always political and socially active, had to do something. Soon after the invasion, we put a Ukraine flag on our social media, and someone wrote in saying, you should learn the general in Russian. And we said, great, let's do it. So in late April, Chad released a Russian version of the band's hit, appealing to Russians to withdraw their support for Putin's war. Ideally, if we had any Russian friends and who knew had family over there, they might share it. First, the singer-songwriter known around the world had to learn Russian. That's where Olga Berg comes in. I had no idea what it is. I never heard of the band. I thought it was very touching. Connected by a friend, Chad and Olga worked on a translation together entirely through virtual meetings. Olga on the border of Ukraine and Poland facilitating humanitarian aid. It was about doing everything we can and I, it felt like the right thing to do. Chad here in the States. Yeah, it was it was difficult. It's, there's a few words like bull, you know, mm-hmm. like the, these words down here in your throat. Together, they went line by line, making sure the general made sense in Russian while keeping the song's melody and pacing. This is the first time you guys have seen each other. I've seen each other alive, yeah. 
so in person. We were in New York City when the pair met for the first time and played the song together. Chad playing the guitar with help from Olga and these posters. <laughs> The final product is powerful. The last thing the general says to his soldiers, go now, you are forgiven. That's a great line. Funds from the song benefiting the Leleka Foundation, providing medical supplies to care for the wounded living in and fighting for Ukraine. Something Chad and I have in common is this interest in sort of social action. The cause, just one of many, Chad and his wife Sybil have taken up over the years through their foundation, Calling All Crows. When I was with Chad in the earlier years, I was able to see what an incredible platform music is for social change. That platform on full display, first in 2004, when the band got back together for one show on Boston's Hat Shell. I was thinking we were going to be lucky to have 30,000 or something. It turned out to be 110. Dispatch, once called the most popular band you've never heard of, with a fan base all over the world, did it again three years later in New York City. That's the pinnacle of any band's career, right? Oh, you got to sell out MSG. You did it three nights in a row, and you gave all of the money? Yeah. To Zimbabwe to help with basic needs like clean water and health clinics. <laughs> Calling All Crows currently working to combat the impact of mass incarceration, partnering with Georgia Senator Raphael Warnock, and taking on something not often talked about, sexual violence in the music industry. I think it's a scary campaign for this industry to take on because uh, there's so much change needed. The foundation working with partners to create guidance, teaching other artists and music venues how to keep fans safe from assault. We did a survey, 85 to 90% of women, I think. Or people we surveyed have said that they've been assaulted at a live music event. We've watched the film industry go through these massive growing pains and necessary changes over the last handful of years. And we just don't feel that the music industry has reached that point. The pair says the campaign is making a difference, so they've created a web series to make the training easier to access. Calling All Crows now helping other bands with their social campaign. Dispatch, touring the summer with OAR. As for the general in Russian... It's a long shot, of course, to have any kind of influence like that, but uh, you got to try. We'll see if it picks up in Russia. Our thanks to Phil for that. And before we go tonight, the image of the day. You saw that exclusive reporting from Jonathan Carl earlier, the former vice president seated with his wife closing the curtains out of fear that the mob outside would see the location of the second family. The third of the January 6th hearings is scheduled for tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern, with much of the focus set to be the alleged pressure campaign against Mike Pence to violate the constitutional responsibility, which he did not. You can watch it, of course, here on ABC. ABC News Live. And that is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Coming up in the next hour, what that interest rate hike means for your pocketbook. And the man who shot and wounded President Reagan back in 1981 is officially a free man. More on that next. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. More Americans choose ABC News, America's number one news source. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. The deeper you go into the black market, the darker it gets. Traffic, Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic.
He thought he was God. He's now one of the most vilified men in the world. He is the everyman. Zelensky is the Tom Hanks of Ukraine. The fact that a little nice Jewish boy is 5'7 is showing up this KGB agent in the Kremlin. What do you say to Americans who see Russia and you not only as a rival, but an unfriendly adversary? Two men at war. Which Vladimir will take over? The world is not going to be the same. So what's good to read this summer? Well, Kate and I have decided to jump in and help you. And we're talking with Oprah, John Irving, and so many popular authors and influencers. So we want you to join us. Myself, Charlie Gibson, and my daughter, Kate Gibson. Oh, hey, that's me. That is, that is you. For the new podcast series, it is called The Bookcase with Kate and Charlie. We will make sure you love what you read. Listen anywhere and anytime. The Bookcase Podcast, wherever you get your podcasts. Hi there, I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. John Hinckley Jr., known for the 1981 attempted assassination of former U.S. President Ronald Reagan, was freed from court oversight today after decades of legal and mental health supervision. A U.S. District Court judge said he would free Hinckley on this date if he continued to remain mentally stable in the community in Virginia where he has lived since 2016. Shortly after noon, Hinckley took to Twitter and declared, after 41 years, two months, and 15 days, freedom at last. Republican Georgia Senate candidate Herschel Walker acknowledged he has a 10-year-old child. He had not previously mentioned this son publicly before, but now many are calling this a contradiction to his previous outspoken calls for black men to play an active role in their lives of their children. Walker's campaign confirmed the existence of his son and dismissed the allegations of secrecy, saying, quote, he's proud of his children to suggest that Herschel is hiding the child because he hasn't used him in his political campaign is offensive and absurd. Pride is back at the White House. Those are the words by President Biden today after signing an executive order to protect LGBTQ plus Americans against what they call discriminatory legislative attacks. The executive orders seek to discourage conversion therapy while also promoting gender affirming surgery and expanding foster care protections for gay and transgender parents and children. Now to the biggest interest rate increase in 28 years. Today, the Federal Reserve raised its key short-term interest rate by three quarters of a percent in an attempt to try to slow down inflation and avoid a recession. For Americans, this means higher rates on credit cards, car loans, and new mortgages. ABC's chief business and economics correspondent, Rebecca Jarvis, shows us how it will impact your wallet. Tonight, with Americans facing historic inflation and record high gas prices, the Federal Reserve increasing interest rates by three quarters of a percent, the largest hike since 1994. We're strongly committed to bringing inflation back down and we're moving expeditiously to do so. The Fed's aggressive move meant to help stabilize prices will also make it more expensive to borrow money. Everything from new credit cards, where the average APR just topped 20 percent for the first time ever, to car loans to mortgage rates which are already climbing from 3% in January to more than 6% now. The cost of homeownership has gone up at the same time that rental rates are rising as well. In real terms, that means the monthly mortgage payment on a $450,000 home has jumped from roughly $1,500 in January to nearly $2,200 today. Alyssa Isaacs and Drew Anderson in Wichita know this firsthand as they try to buy a home. We weren't particularly happy with the rate we got, but the rates have gone up since then. As for those record oil and gas prices, President Biden sending a letter to executives of seven major oil companies warning them he's considering invoking emergency powers to boost refinery output. Warning, profit margins well above normal being passed directly onto American families are not acceptable. But U.S. refineries are already currently running near full capacity. The White House today pressed on what the letters actually mean, offering few specifics. We are calling on them to do the right thing, to be patriots here, uh, and not to use the war uh, as an excuse or as a, as a reason uh, to, not put, to not put out a production. 
making that appeal to oil executives. Our thanks to Rebecca Jarvis for that. Now to the latest on coronavirus. An FDA advisory panel met today to discuss two vaccines for America's youngest age group, the last group of Americans still not eligible for a COVID vaccine. This comes just one day after the same panel unanimously voted in favor of Moderna's vaccine for six to 17 year olds. ABC's Whit Johnson has those details. Tonight, an FDA panel voting unanimously to give COVID vaccines the green light for children under five. The vote is unanimous. We have 21 out of 21 yes votes. The FDA says both vaccines from Pfizer and Moderna appeared safe and effective, despite mild symptoms like irritability and fever. Does the benefit outweigh the risk of this vaccine? And I think that the evidence is pretty clear. Pfizer's vaccine, a three-shot series, is one-tenth the size of the adult dose. The company's early data showed it was 80% effective in preventing symptomatic COVID. Moderna's vaccine, only two shots, is a quarter of the size of the adult dose. Early data showed it was about 40 to 50% effective at preventing mild infections. But experts caution those numbers are based on small samples. Both vaccines generated antibody levels against Omicron similar to those seen in adults, meaning they will likely also offer protection against severe disease. We should be paying attention also to the antibody response and how well these vaccines protect against severe illness and hospitalization. With the sign-off from the full FDA and the CDC expected within days, we could see shots going into arms as early as next Tuesday. To the relief of many parents, our thanks to WIT. And now we head overseas to the war in Ukraine. And word that two Americans fighting on the side of the Ukrainians may have been captured by Russian forces. This is conditions are deteriorating in a key eastern city as Russia makes advances. ABC's James Longman reports from the front lines once again tonight. Tonight, the families of two American veterans gone missing in Ukraine have asked U.S. lawmakers to help find them. It comes as reports surface that two Americans fighting for the Ukrainians have been captured by Russian forces near Kharkiv in the northeastern part of the country. The men, Alexander Druki, who's 39, and Andy Huynh, 27, were reportedly serving as volunteers with the Ukrainian army outfit. The U.S. State Department says they're aware of unconfirmed reports and are closely monitoring the situation. If it's true, we'll do everything we can to, to, uh, to get them uh, safely back home. Other Westerners have been taken prisoner during this war, including two from the U.K., who were sentenced to death by Russian-backed separatists after they accused them of being mercenaries. This comes as President Biden announced the biggest single U.S. military aid commitment to date after speaking with Ukrainian President Zelensky today. A billion dollars in new equipment, including howitzers, ammunition for rocket systems, and for the first time, American harpoon anti-ship missile systems. Our thanks to James for that. For some Americans, they're considered law-breaking criminals. For others, they're considered desperate humans fleeing corruption, violence, and catastrophes, in some cases caused by climate change. The ongoing debate over migrants arriving to our nation's border is a tenuous one. But a program launched by Governor Abbott, known as Operation Lone Star, is using state resources to allegedly bring safety and control back to Texas. Our ABC's Maria Villarreal brings us the first of a two-part report on the impact this policy is having, starting with the migrants seeking asylum. Grocery shopping. Patatas, la famosa patata. Museum hopping. La Virgen Morena. And a nature walk. It's the little things Gaston appreciates these days, but nothing comes close to video chats with his wife and children back home. Chao, Dios lo bendiga. Chao, chao. Gaston says he's living in the U.S. alone, risking death threats while working as a human rights lawyer in Venezuela, a country plagued with political corruption, high unemployment, and severe economic issues. Que mi miedo es creíble. Mi miedo era ese. Mi miedo era este, que no estuviera preso, eh, que no pudiera socorrer a mi familia, este, que no los viera, y, y que me pasara algo, como le ha pasado a muchísimas personas. Gaston explains he spent years defending political opponents of Venezuela's Nicolás Maduro's regime, mostly students jailed for speaking out against the government. In Venezuela, I was a lawyer in exercise, dedicated to the defense of the defense of the students. We defended them in a way of gratuity their interests of judicial, to the point of taking them to liberty. Malas prácticas que hacía el régimen contra esta persona solamente por su disidencia. 
Gaston worried it was only a matter of time before he ended up in a cell himself. He fled Venezuela, making his way to the U.S.-Mexico border to seek asylum in the United States. He swam across the Rio Grande hoping to surrender to U.S. border officials, but instead he was arrested by troopers with the Texas Department of Public Safety. Yo le presenté mis credenciales, mira, yo soy abogado, aquí está mi credencial, y este, lo único que me dijo fue, este, te tengo que detener, coloca las manos atrás. Gaston says what followed was 33 days of hell. Te puedo decir que este es la discriminación más terrible que puede sufrir un ser humano privado de su libertad. In a statement to ABC News, the Texas Department of Criminal Justice says they've worked with the Texas Commission on Law Enforcement and the Texas Commission on Jail Standards to ensure identified state facilities meet state standards to hold pretrial confinees and post-conviction inmates. Gaston spent five weeks, and that's actually on the low end. We've had clients that have spent months in those prisons awaiting trials, months in those prisons unable to afford bond. And these are people that are not criminals. Kristen Eaton represented Gaston's case against the state once he was detained. The current federal law authorizes somebody to do exactly what Gaston did, which was to come across the river and, and seek asylum. And so we have clients all over the country, again, that are here and able to apply for asylum and wait in the United States. Gaston is just one of thousands of migrants who have been kept in detention centers like this one, using Operation Lone Star, a Texas-run border security initiative created by Governor Greg Abbott. Texas will be taking its own unprecedented actions this month to do what no state in the America has ever done in the history of this country to better secure our state as well as our nation. In May of last year, Abbott filed a disaster declaration based on the influx of migrant traffic in Texas that covers 48 Texas counties, 32 of them along the border. The declaration leading to the creation of Operation Lone Star. I got you a program where an estimated 10,000 soldiers from the Texas National Guard and Department of Public Safety are being used for immigration patrols in addition to federal agents. Texas has essentially militarized the border to make apprehensions and arrests primarily of migrants for criminal trespass offenses. Governor Abbott says the program is intended to stop smugglers. Since the federal government, not states, has the power to enforce immigration law, Texas troopers can only make arrests if migrants trespass on a private property. Allí no había ningún, eh, ningún, ningún aviso que dijera que, que eso era propiedad privada, eh, ni, que, ni que yo haya tumbado una pared, ni, ni haya penetrado una cerca. According to the Texas Department of Criminal Justice, to date the program has made just over 4,100 total trespassing arrests. We have clients that are arrested multiple times for criminal trespass. They're released and they come back. There's really no deterrent value in these criminal trespass prosecutions at all. The strategy of expelling migrants does not appear to have slowed immigration. But the price tag of funding the operation continues to go up, with Texas taxpayers fronting the cost. Texas has spent more than $4 billion on Operation Lone Star. That is a lot of money that is being spent, that has been taken away from other areas of need in Texas. In late April, nearly $500 million in additional funding was approved by Governor Abbott and state leadership for the operation. While Gaston's asylum case moves through the federal courts, he's hoping that he can one day make a living for himself in the U.S. and support his family back home. Por milagro de Dios, este, eh, ha querido que, que, que mi vida continúe, eh, que ayude a los míos, que ayude a mi familia, que ayude a mi país, y que de una u otra manera pues, este, permanezcamos aquí en Estados Unidos a pesar de de todas esas esa diferencias y todos esos acontecimientos que han pasado. Gracias a Dios, eh, no me ha ido mal. Our thanks to Maria for that. And still to come, the alleged confession in the case of the British journalist killed in Brazil and the twist to the popular series Iron Chef. Stay with us. 
This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen feet in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. Welcome back. We're tracking several headlines around the world. According to local reports, Brazilian suspects in the disappearance of British journalist Dom Phillips and his Brazilian guy Bruno Pereira have confessed to killing and dismembering the men. Witnesses saw police take a masked and hooded man out of the river where the men vanished. Police have not commented on the reported confession and the suspect's family has denied they had any role in the men's disappearance. Take a look at this video released this week that shows a ship carrying nearly 16 thousand sheep sunk off Sudan's uh, Sudan's Red Sea coast as it was headed to Saudi Arabia. Inspectors at the port noticed that the ship was slightly leaning to the right as it was supposed to start its journey. A statement by Sudan's Seaports Corporation said, it's not yet known whether any sheep died in the accident and officials believe either overlord, overload or a crack could have been the cause. Lawmakers in Thailand today passed four different bills on same-sex unions, moving one step closer toward becoming the second territory in Asia to legalize same gender marriages. The four drafts approved on each seek to provide same-sex partners with almost the same legal rights as heterosexual couples, but activists say its laws and institutions have yet to reflect changing social attitudes and still discriminate against LGBTQ people and same-sex couples. Thailand has one of Asia's most open and visible LGBTQ plus communities. Now to the new legendary twist, a culinary competition we all know, Iron Chef, quest for an iron legend is serving up a next-level cooking challenge on Netflix. Five new trailblazing Iron Chefs will face off against Challenger Chefs. The most successful challenger will return to battle in a grand finale for the chance to be named the first-ever Iron Legend. Our Trevor Alt spoke with star hosts Alton Brown and Kristen Kish about how the ingredients of this new series make it a dish worth watching. With an open heart and empty stomach, I say unto you in the words of my uncle. At long last, the uh, long-awaited return of Iron Chef. This time it's got a fancy colon uh, and a subtitle, Quest for an Iron Legend. Everyone is incredibly excited. We, of course, have the hosts now, hosts, Kristen Kish, Alton Brown. Thanks so much for being here talking with me. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Are you both on the floor in Kitchen Stadium? Oh yeah, I mean, we're in it all the time. I stay up on my perch, I mean, which is on the floor, but she's actually down in the mud, so to speak. Right. He um, sends me in for snacks. She gets things splashed all over her. It's a dry <laughs> cleaner's nightmare. That's amazing, I love it. How was it developing the chemistry for something like that? We didn't. We didn't have to develop anything. 
Oh, I was like, where are you going with this? I was getting a little <laughs> nervous because like, you're like my best friend. We just got lucky. Honestly, I will, and I have to give credit to Elton, is he was so... Well, if you must. He was so gracious in the first day, the rehearsal, the first episode, so gracious at helping me find my way. And I a thousand percent can say with a million percent certainty is that I wouldn't have been able to be successful on the show if it weren't for his help. She's wow. a natural. She's a natural. She's just not going to say that. I know that I needed him, especially going into this for the very first time with someone who knows, who's been doing this for how many years? Is Let's not talk about that. Many years. <laughs> she can empathize with the chefs that are participating in a way that, quite frankly, I can't. I am so focused on the food. She's very much uh, focused on, on the personalities and the spirit of the competition. And Kristen brings a, a level of storytelling to the show that it has never had before. Kristen, I know that it comes natural to be to be humble. Obviously, you're a natural. Anybody that's seen you host anything knows, knows that you're skilled at it. Isn't it true that in the casting, though, for this, they said, what role would you be comfortable in, and you said host? It all happened very quickly from my <coughs> point of view. They said, I got a call, and they're like, hey, the Iron Chef is coming back to Netflix. Um, they want to talk to you. And before anything else could come out, I said, I'm not cooking because my anxiety cannot handle any of that anymore. And also, like, I already won. I don't need to show up again and, like, accidentally lose. So I was like, I, I'm not going to do it. And then I was like, well, maybe, like, judging or co-hosting. When I said it, I knew what I was saying, but I wasn't confident it was actually going to happen. And then it did happen. You said a couple months ago, before it was announced the show was coming back, that you felt being in Kitchen Stadium before was like your master's degree and you wanted to come back for the PhD. So now that you're Dr. Brown, what's your culinary <laughs> dissertation? Oh, my culinary dissertation um, would be um, how Iron Chef has influenced a generation of home cooks. Because I, I do believe that this show, in, in all of its iterations, and its legacy, has been a huge influence on what people in this country, at least, cook. Now, the real difference is we're about to be in a bunch of countries uh, that we've never had the opportunity to be in before. So it'll be great to see what the, the global effect of that is. Other than getting to broadcast all these other countries, now that you're with Netflix, what are the big differences? Are you dropping F-bombs all over the place? <laughs> we are not. <laughs> no, we do that silently to each other. <laughs> Number one, uh, there are no commercials. This is an hour show for an hour battle, so there's a lot more opportunity to follow the action. Uh, because Kristen is, is here, uh, we get to have actual conversations about what's going on, which I think brings a different dimension. Also, everything's amped up. The Kitchen Stadium is bigger. Kitchen Stadium is better. It's more technologically advanced. The set, in general, has become part of the storytelling in a way that it couldn't before. Kristen, I know that you know, having competed in these things, what I hear all the time from athletes or people that come and get to watch the sporting event in person is that it's way faster than you think it is watching it broadcast. Is that the case? A hundred percent. You go in there and you know that clock is going. The first like 30 minutes, it definitely goes faster than you actually think it's going. That last five minutes though, for some reason, and I think it's like a human nature thing, it must be where you want to subconsciously slow down time just a little bit, and all of a sudden you started rushing, and then that last five minutes you're like, oh crap, I'm plating too soon, or something like that. I'm sure you get asked this all the time. I'm sure the question is constantly guilty pleasure food to eat. I don't like the term guilty pleasure food. It's good. Well, she has no like. guilt about anything mm -hmm. she eats, so there's no Zero guilty guilt. pleasure. There's just pleasure. Is there something that defies typical culinary convention that is one of your favorite things to eat? So growing up, my mom would go on these like diets, right? And she'd get the prepackaged diet meals where you're only supposed to eat one for a meal. I would microwave all three of them and eat them all in one sitting. And she would be so angry with me that I was eating her diet food, but it was so dang good because it was convenient. I like her answer. That's a very, very good answer. I don't know that I have one, to be honest. I, th I think when, when I was a kid, I would uh, find uh, old dried donuts and put them in the mug mm. and then put mint chip ice cream on top of it um, and then milk. And, and that's why I still have the body style that I have today. <laughs> I'm built for, for distance and comfort, uh, not speed. Kristen Kish, Alton Brown, Iron Chef, Quest for an Iron Legend. Ice cream, that is my guilty pleasure. I run so that I can eat ice cream. Our thanks to Trevor for that. You can stream season one of Iron Chef, Question for the quest for an iron legend right now on Netflix.
It was the most popular series ever on Netflix, and now it's about to become a reality competition show. But if you've ever watched Squid Game, you're probably confused about how they can pull this off without contestants leaving unscathed or even alive. Will Reeve has more on the challenge and the more than $4 million prize. Hear that? The ominous song that struck fear into the hearts of millions around the world means Squid Game is back, the most popular series ever on Netflix. This time for real, sort of. A newly announced reality show with 456 competitors and $4.56 million at stake for the winner. Sound familiar? Squid Game The Challenge comes amid struggles at Netflix. Its stock price down more than 70% so far this year, after the company announced a steep loss in subscribers. They are looking to bring subscribers back. What better way to do that than bring back the Squid Game audience? They've also seen success in other reality shows. So it's a great way to combine one audience with another and hopefully bring in a whole new group of subscribers. Perhaps an attempt to capitalize on the massive success of the ultra-violent Korean language thriller that swept the globe last fall. The show reaching number one in at least 94 countries, translated into over 30 languages, even earning award season love. And I love you, my skill game crew. Fans sharing their own attempts to recreate the playground games featured in the series on social media. The show's creator and director, Huang dong Yuk, told us last year he finds inspiration in the fan theories and plot ideas he sees online. Maybe I'll, I'll go through the old YouTube again if I have to write the, the season two, then I'll steal the ideas from the fans. It looks like he'll finally get that chance, now that the show has also officially been renewed for a second season. Hey. And while we wait to see what season two has in store, we do have some idea of what a real live squid game might look like. If they move right now, they're out. They have to hold this position until we say green light. Green light. YouTuber Mr. Beast spent $2 million recreating the show's set to host his own version of the game. Wow, he has some money to play with there. Our thanks to Will. And still to come, the call for help and how a community rally to save some dogs in potential distress. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24 Seven. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. The most powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Ready for a little GMA ish promo? Okay, here we go. GMA 7A every day with Robin, George, and Michael. That's how you start the day. Boom! America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Welcome back. A call for help answered in central Ohio. An animal shelter is in the dark thanks to a massive power outage. And now hundreds of dogs are fighting the heat. Reporter Bree Buckley from our partner station WSYX shows us how the community stepped up for these pups waiting for their forever homes. <laughs> The Franklin County Dog Shelter put out a call for help and Central Ohio answered. Thank you so much. The shelter lost power Tuesday afternoon as part of the widespread outages. We had a couple dogs in surgery, but they were able to successfully close them up. Anything that was needing immediate help, we put them out in our vans and turn the air on and they're kind of driving around with them. But with the extreme heat, they asked for bags of ice. <laughs> 
to help keep the pups as cool and safe as possible. My daughter adopted her dog from here, so just trying to pay back. Those donations showing up in droves. Uh, about 260 pounds total, so what? big thank you to my neighbors for their contribution. The shelter's small generator helping run fans, the ice going in kennels to cool the ground. And it's been phenomenal. Uh, we do have a big cooler that we can keep it in, so all night long we can keep using it. But with the shelter completely full, Director Kay Persinger says they may have to evacuate if power isn't restored by the morning. So we are at capacity and uh, every shelter around us is right now, so we can't get a lot of relief from them coming to help us. She says staff and volunteers will monitor the dogs closely overnight to make sure they don't overheat. It breaks my heart and I wish I could take all of them home with me. On your side, I'm Brie Buckley reporting. Getting some much needed relief there. That is our show for tonight. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Have a great night. America's number one news.